last week, we kicked off our series here entitled Bridge Builders. And we discussed having the right blueprints that make all the difference in the process of forgiveness. And as we continue our series here today, we're going to take a look at the next step in the process, which is making sure that we have the right tools for the project. Now, during the American Revolution, a man in civilian clothes rode past a group of soldiers that happened to be repairing a defensive barrier. And their leader was shouting instructions, but was making no attempt to help them, just barking orders. And asked why, by the writer, he retorted with great dignity. He, he says, uh, he asked why he wasn't helping by this writer. And he says, sir, I'm a corporal. And the stranger apologized, and he dismounted and proceeded to help the exhausted soldiers with the task. And when the job was done, he turned to the corporal and said, Mr. Corporal, next time you have a job like this and not enough men to do it, go to your commander-in-chief and I will come and I'll help you again. He didn't recognize his commander-in-chief, George Washington. You know, there was a clear barrier between the commander-in-chief and these soldiers, but George Washington broke that barrier and he bridged the gap to support his fellow soldiers in their struggle. We read earlier, and I want to repeat again, in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 28, Jesus tells this story. He says, on one occasion, an expert in the law, a lawyer, stood up to test Jesus. He says, teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, Jesus did, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And I love the next line. He says, the lawyer does, you have answered correctly. And Jesus replied, do this, and you will live. You know, during this deliberation between Jesus and this lawyer, I want to draw attention to the first question that he asks. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? You know, a lawyer in this time would be someone who is that expert in the law, like it says. He knows what's going on. He's read it. He's studied it. And he understands here. But he approaches Jesus, and the lawyer knows all this. He knows what the law says, but he wants to see what Jesus has to say about it. It's a test. Is it a good question? Well, certainly it's a good question, but it has a bad motivation behind it because not only is this a test, but the lawyer is mistaken with the idea of what he needs to do to earn his own way to heaven. What he can do to earn it. And even as an expert of the law, this lawyer was still mistaken for what it takes to have eternal life. And Jesus challenges the lawyer's knowledge with, well, what does the law state? He comes back with a question. Everyone knows Jesus does that a lot. And he knows that the lawyer knows what the law says, and so he responds correctly. And I love what Jesus says here. He says, now go and do it. Go and do it. And I like like the story of George Washington, as Christians, we have to make a choice. We can be like the corporal and watch as others struggle, or we can take action. We need to talk about what it is to take action. We have to have the right tools that will make the project work. That's important. As I said last week, we discussed that we need to have the blueprints necessary for bridge building. And now that we have the plan, we need to take action. And in the case of building a bridge, that means gathering those tools. So what tools do we need? And so having the right tools can make or break the project. And as believers, we've been given some divine tools. So let's take a look at our toolbox here. If you would, in Galatians chapter 5, it's a familiar passage of Scripture, isn't it? 
what we call the fruit of the Spirit. And it defines tools that we are given by the Holy Spirit to build the perfect bridge. See them there. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Christian character is not mere moral or legal correctness, but it's the possession and the manifestation of these nine graces, if you will. These nine pieces of fruit that we show in our lives. These tools are, are the foundation of our moral portrait of Christ. And if we want to bridge the gap and eliminate the chasm between others today, we must ensure that we have the right tools in our toolbox. Now, I don't know how you are about putting things together. But I remember, you know, when the kids were little, you'd go to the store and you might be put in a kitchen center. You find this kitchen center and you open up the box. And you ever have the, you open up the box and they hand, they, they said, everything is in there that you need. Right? And then you go in there and you're thinking, well, there's no screwdriver, there's no this. And they hand you this little tool. But sometimes they look like an Allen wrench. I remember sometimes we got something that looked like a wrench on one end with a circle on the other end. And I'm thinking, I have no idea how that is going to work to put that toy together. Or that piece of furniture for the kids in their toy room. You know, if only one tool is provided, like an Allen wrench or such, you know, who knows, and you only use that one, how long is it going to take you to put that play kitchen together? You know, I prefer at my house just to read the instructions and let my wife do the rest. It's really worked out pretty well for 36 years, huh? It's much better that way. She has much better understanding of those things than her husband has. You see... The instructions, though, by themselves won't get the job done, do they? What's worse is when they give you those things and they just show you pictures. They want you to, I, I won't even go there, but that's another story, okay? That, that. And, you know, insufficient tools may, death, well, may indefinitely prolong the project, and sometimes you simply just need to grab a different, more precise and powerful tool to finish up. And thankfully, through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, we have all the access to an amazing array of tools. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are all tools that can help us finish the project, build those bridges. So whether it's reconciliation or evangelism, discipleship, if it's missions, we must all be willing to take advantage, though, of the opportunities that we're given. But we have to get into our toolbox. We have to get into the Bible and say, this is what and how God wants me to be and what we need to use. So that's exactly what we need to do, though. We need to work on those things and then take advantage of the opportunities. That right tool. John 4 Verse 35 says, don't you have a saying, Jesus asked, it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. You see, we have the blueprints. We have the right tools if we allow them to manifest themselves in us. And as we continue to strive to love one another, we need to bridge those gaps. At this point in time, I'd like you to think about something. I'd like you to think about a person in your life that you have that gap with. And as we continue through here, I want you to think about what it's going to take to bridge that gap with that person. Okay? As we apply these things, if you will. We have the blueprints, we have the right tools, and we need to bridge those gaps. We have an opportunity to show the true character of Christ through love. You see, people don't like truly to be alienated. We all like to belong. 
That's the way God made us. The fields are ripe for harvest. And as Christians, we're called to be a reflection of Jesus. And what better way than to be a mirror to show grace and mercy, though, to those in need? See, the opportunities are around us every day. And we have to be able to take that aspect. You know, God made this pretty clear to me this week. On Thursdays, and you're all welcome to join me at Thursday, Thursdays at 6.30, we have a meeting at McDonald's, and I meet with a, a friend, Larry Diebold, and, and uh, we were there and everything, and I noticed before we got there, I noticed there was this gentleman that was outside, and he was eating at the outside area there at the McDonald's. And I thought, that's, that's interesting. And uh, it wasn't too much later that this gentleman was in, and he was standing at where we were sitting at, at which he proceeded to ask us if we could be, could give him some money, okay, because he was hungry. So I had seen him eat, which probably meant that he had talked someone into, probably on one side, getting him something so he could have on the other side. And I think somebody, somebody must have done that, or he asked for money, and they probably said, we'll do that. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. I said, I, I really don't have any money to give you. I said, but I'll be more than glad to walk up there with you and be able to give, to, to help you eat. And he had to think about that for a second. And he says, I guess I really don't care how it happens. He didn't. You see, he just knew he had a need. And that first need had to be bridged before anything else could take place. He didn't really want to join us. I can understand that. And he got off before I got back to it. In that respect. But we all have opportunities around us every day. And the story of the Good Samaritan reminds us of that. I want to read that again from Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 37. It says, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. And they stripped him of his clothes, they beat him, and then they went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on the other side. And he went to him, or excuse me, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, he went over, reached out, and when he saw him, and he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you have. That which he turns to the expert of the law and says, Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers. 